Okay, hello everybody. Um, that's an interesting experience. This is the first talk after rebirth uh, on, a, on a stage like this. So yeah, real people. And I can see in your face whether you are smiling, tired, or I can even see when you go away and you just not turn off the video and just are black. So, good. Good experience. Um, a lot of things have changed in the past two years. One thing that has changed is C++. So, we have to talk about C++ 20, but um, the title of this talk doesn't use C++ 20. We talk about universal and forwarding references. So, why is that now a topic for C++ 20 and why it comes so urgent? Um, we have them already for a long time, since C++ 11, but now it's important to understand them because ordinary programmers have to use universal or forwarding references. You might be wondering why are there two terms? That's something we have to understand. Okay, first of all, I think everybody knows that we have references in C++. The reason is, well, we have two reasons for that. One is we want to um, call functions that have out parameters, so that modify or return something in a parameter for, for an argument. And the other reason is we have const references to avoid copying. So we call a function, a reference is just an additional name for the argument we pass, we modify it, and then later on we pass it to print to print it out, and that's a const reference. So without copying this string, we can deal with this string. Okay, these were the fastest first eight slides I ever had in a talk. So now let's talk about the more important stuff and the more complicated stuff, which is our value references. So in C++11, we introduced move semantics. And we used to improve it in a way that works as follows. Well, if you see here on the right-hand side, that we have a vector, which is initially empty, and a string s initialized with some return value of get data, and we want to push it back, the value of s, into the vector, this is usually copied. Our containers have copy semantics. Uh, it's always copied. It was always copied before C++11. So whether we returned something, whether we concatenated a string with itself, with also, which also returns a temporary string, um, or whether we push it again into the vector, even if we no longer need it, it was copied. And these copies were unnecessary. Um, the way the problem was, we had only one pushback. The pushback took the past argument as a const reference, so we don't modify it in any way, and internally the vector created a copy of this. So in C++, 11, we introduced move semantics, and to do that, we introduced a new syntax for another type of references, which are called R value references. And that takes an argument with two ampersand and no const. And that's not a double reference, it's just another syntax for, well, a different contract, a different kind of semantic agreement we have between the caller and those who implement pushback here. And the deal is the, the caller no longer needs the value of this um, value, while in the first pushback we still need the value. So, and the nice thing is that compilers automatically pass our objects to the second function when we know that this object is about to die. And that's the case when it's a temporary object. Um, and there are other ways to say that to the compiler. But here, when we have get data, which is destroyed, the return value is destroyed at the end of the statement, automatically the second pushback is called. And with S plus S, we have the same. So we can also help the compiler by passing S to, uh, by declaring S with move. And move does not do anything with S, it just marks it as, I no longer need the value here. That's a translation of move, 
was, yeah, four characters is nice. It should have been called movable because that sounds less active, but okay, we, we call it in move. And uh, okay, so that's it. Um, we have now two pushbacks and we have a new syntax, one with two ampersand, one with cons and one ampersand. So we call them R value references and L value references. So, but we have to understand a couple of things here that are not that easy to understand. You might know them already, you might not. So we have first to talk about value categories. If I usually give training and ask who knows value categories, no hand is raised. If I ask who has heard about L value and R value, everybody raises a hand. Um, if I then ask where's, what stands the L for, what stands the L for? Left, left, that's wrong. And here's the story. So when we standardize C, C no, we, no, not we, when Cunningham and Richies came up with C and uh, they tried to formulate rules about uh, what compiles and what does not compile. And it's not only the types that matter. You can see it here in this example um, because we have here an assignment operator and on the left-hand side we have an int, on the right-hand side we have an int. By definition, 42 is an int and i is declared as an int. So, but only one of this compiles. So they introduced value categories to say, well, the thing that is here, 42, is different than the thing i. And they said, everything that can be on the left-hand side of an assignment is an l value. There came the l from, yes, you were right, but wait a minute. And then on the right-hand side, things that can only be on the right-hand side were r values. The problems occurred when, even in C already, when they, oh, by the way, sorry. It's not only for, about assignment. It's also in other places where we say, does this compile, is that valid code or not? So another example is, can we take the address of i of 42 of an int? Well, we can take the address of an L value, but we cannot take the address of an R value. That's not allowed. And, okay. So things become more, became more complicated when then later on C was standardized so that we had the American and National Standards Institute C where we introduced const. We, I mean the others. And uh, so an interesting effect this had. Well, you could no longer assign something to C, but you could take the address. So the question was, is it still an L value or is it an R value now? What is the category? Uh, how do we deal with that? And the answer was, interestingly, it's still an L value. Um, so you can do more or less everything except having it on the left hand side of an assignment. And so the L was gone. Uh, so it no longer means left, the L here. If you look into the C standard, you see a different term. The term is now locator value. So a value where you can deal with the location of this value in your program. You can ask for the address. Um, so the other, the, I, I don't, I'm not aware of any official name for this R, at least not in the C standard I found anything. Um, so readable value might be some way to describe it. So everything that was C. We adopted C, we are compatible to C and C++. So we adopted all these rules and the value categories. Uh, but then we got move semantic. And with move semantic, an interesting question occurred, which was if I have an L value like S here, and I mark it with move, can it, is it an L value or an R value? Well, the experts in the core language group, which uh, care about really crazy details and borderline tricky code, they uh, decided, well, well, uh, well, before I tell you that, let me sh ask for a show of hands. Who thinks that the statement in the middle, so move of S equals hello is valid C++? Who thinks yes? Please raise your hand. Who thinks it's not valid? 
hey, Bryce, you didn't raise your hand. What's that? <laughs> okay. So who thinks that you can take the address of std move of s? Raise your hands. Who thinks you cannot? Here's the answer. Anybody right? Good. Well, the answer is not always true. If the thing you have there is an int, a fundamental data type, both of an error. <laughs> but that's one of the crazy details we have in this language. I don't explain why. That's something for the core guys. I'm an application programmer. Um, I have to explain now what the hat that are the consequences of that. And one consequence of this was move of s. Is this an L value or an R value? Hmm. Well, so we, can take, we cannot take an address, but it can be on the left-hand side of an assignment. So there was a big discussion. And at the end, the proposal was, it's a new category. It's called x value. So we call it x value for expiring value. Now it got even better. We said, but most of the time, an x value behaves like an r value. So we do the following. What we formally called r value is now a common term for either what was formally called r value or x value. So we introduced something called pr value. That is what was formally called an r value. And then we have this x value. Are you completely confused? Yes, that's why we have a lot of half knowledge here in C++ when we deal with value categories. So is it an L value or not? So here's the, the result. So that's one of the few figures we have in the C++ standard. We have, uh, if we have any expression in the code, it is either an L value or an X value or a PR value. Roughly, the rules are as follows. L value is something you can take an address that especially applies to everything that has a name. Interesting, also, string literals have a specified location in the program, so you can take the address, so that's also an L value. So, um, then we have PR values. That Everything else before C++11, so what was formerly called just an R value, they still are because R value is a common term for that, but the PR value are all the other literals, and then we have some special rules, so things that have no name, temporaries without a name, well, a few other things like lambdas, lambdas, if you create them, a lambda, that's an object of a class created of a type deduced from the lambda, that's a PR value, result of a constructor call. Yeah. And if you have return values, you return by value. That's also PR value. That's a temporary object without a name. If you return with a single ampersand, so with an L, as an L value reference, it's an L value. And then we have X value. X value is everything marked with move and a cast to an R value reference, uh, except if what you cast as a function. These are the simplified rules as far as I can understand them. And I, I'm sure there are some details missing. That's just terminology. But a few things follow from that. Well, fortunately, you don't have to know this all. The compilers know it. So they know the rules. For example, um, this V is an L value. You can pass it to a L value reference, which is not const, and to an L value reference which is cons, so therefore this compiles, and the one and two here means this has priority over that. So priority one means this is preferred if both functions are there. For non-const, L values, C is an L value, it has a name. You can only pass it to a const L value reference. Often for a temporary object, you can also only pass it to a const L value reference. You cannot pass temporary objects to a non-const L value reference. That's important because we come back to that fact later on. So, and now with the, the value category of this temporary object was R value. It still is, but the detail, uh, the primary category is now PR value. Got it? Okay. So, now we have move. Move says, well, we have an X value here, that's the other, the third category. And now you can see 
why we call the thing on the right, the declaration with two ampersand, we call that R value reference, because it can only refer to R values. Yeah, because here, it can refer to a temporary object, which is a PR value, or to an X value, which is an L value marked with moved. Common term is R value, so that's an R value reference. And the other is called L value reference. And by the way, you see something else here in this picture. If you don't have a function overloaded with an R value reference, there's a fallback. The const L value reference can also be used. This is a fallback mechanism saying, if there's no support for move semantics, we take copy semantics. So if you don't have a move constructor, we take the copy constructor, for example. Pretty easy, okay? That's all basics. <laughs> we are the basics. We didn't talk about universal references yet. There's one slide, and when I take this slides in my training, I usually say this is the worst slide I have. It's not because of me, hopefully. It's because of the fact I have to teach. Everybody is confused by this slide, except those who know it already. So let's look at this slide. Think about you have a function that takes an R value reference. So like here. So we have an R value reference to string. Obviously, what we just learned is we only take R values. So if I declare a string, an object that has a name, pass it to the function that will not compile because I'm not allowed to pass an L value to an R value reference. I can only pass or bind this reference to R values. So this will not compile, and I think you everybody has seen this error message, cannot bind R value reference to L value. Okay. Interestingly, this compiles. Now everybody should scream out loud here. What is the category of a string literal? L value. L values are objects with names or string literals. That's an L value. So didn't I say I can only pass R values? Well, welcome to the magic of C++ and of implicit type conversions. There's a hidden operation here, which we don't see. The operation is um, we have to convert this type to the type of string, which creates a temporary object, and that is an R value. And so what you really write there is this, and this is compiled. And now you see that you pass a temporary object that has no name. So you pass an R value. And therefore, this compiles. Okay? If you want to pass the string, which is an L value, you have to mark it with move, which means we convert the string to an X value, which is an R value, and then, therefore, this is taken by foo RV. That's the first half of the slide. Wait with the photo. <laughs> so the second part is now coming. Let's look at the implementation of this function. Here's the implementation. So the function takes an R value reference to a string. So the type of S is R value reference to string. What is the value category of S? L value, it has a name. Yes. The type is an R value reference. The category is an L value. So using S means we have um, all the rules, like SDR here. Well, if you use objects that are references, the fact that they are references no longer matters. Yeah, it's only a question about initialization or what you can pass. So that has an interesting consequence. You cannot call yourself. <laughs> Recursion is not possible because it's an L value. If you um, have an L value here, um, that cannot be bound to an R value reference. You have to mark it with move again. Now you can take the picture, yes. <laughs> it, um, that is, by the way, the formal background to the rule move semantics is not passed through. Move semantics, remember, 
If I mark something with move me, means I no longer need the value of this object here. So we have set with the first move on top of uh, the definition of move RV, uh, um, we have said I no longer need the value of SDR here. So to some extent, the parameter of foo RV gets the ownership of the value. They can do whatever they want to do with that. So, um, but to be able to use it twice, it has no move semantic until you say here where you no longer need the value. So you have to say it with another move here. And that's important. We could not implement swap or things like that if we wouldn't have that feature that move semantics is not passed through automatically. Okay? Now, here's a secret which you might know. What does move do? It's a static cast. It's a static cast to an R value reference of the type of the arguments you pass. So what you do, you pass the object to its own type. <laughs> the reason is, static cast does not only change types. If static cast converts to an R value reference, you change the value category. So some people said oh, maybe instead of calling it move, we call it 2R value or so. It was another name of SCD move being discussed. So by definition, a static cast to an R value reference changes the category, and that is what we need here. We don't have to change the type, we only have to change the category. Now it's an R value, and with that we have said we no longer need the value of S, and now we can pass it recursively to ourselves again. Okay, so, please note what we have now as option to declare call by reference. We have the option to say, okay, let's pass it by const L value reference, which means I have only read access, I don't want to modify the value, I cannot modify the value, this binds to everything. That's an in parameter, we just read the value, we avoid copying. So the next was, we have a non-const L value reference that does not bind to everything, it only binds to non-const named objects, or as we just learned, L values. So that way you can say we have an object and we store there in the object, if you pass it to me as a parameter, we store there a new value or we modify your value or whatsoever. Now the new thing we have is we have our value references for types. That is um, the contract is the caller no longer needs a value, so those who are called can modify it. So why did we introduce a new syntax at all? Because you could also modify it with the second signature. Well, here you can pass temporary objects. And uh, that was important to do because you cannot pass temporary object to a non-const L value reference. So here you can pass only R values. And then there's an interesting feature. I don't know if you are aware of that. We also have const R value references. That is funny what that is. That is technically allowed, but it makes semantically no sense. Because remember what we have here, we have a contradiction. We say, well, I no longer need the value. As a caller, I no longer need the value, but um, you are not allowed to modify my value. <laughs> Is it good for something? Yes, we will find for every crazy thing in C++ one useful application. We are pretty sure about that. Um, for example, in optional, SCD optional, we really have signatures that take that. Um, just because it's a wrapper and we don't know whether this might be used somewhere. <laughs> That's the reason, by the way. So, okay. Um, the interesting consequence of this is you have that more often than you think. 
the moment you declare something with const and you mark it with move, you have a const r value reference. But as nobody implements a function for that, now if we would have pushed back with this signature, that would be called. Um, but as we ha don't have a pushback for that, we have only one for const l value references. So that is used, and so the move has no effect. So by having this const, you disable move semantics. Same is true if you take a const l value reference and you mark it with move, move will not work. It's not an error. It uh, it's, will just copy. The reason is, if we have generic code, think about this is just a T const std string as a whole is T. So sometimes it might be const, sometimes not. If not, we want to benefit from move semantics, otherwise copying is fine. And here's another thing. If you have a function returning a value and you mark it with const, some programmers do that, you have screwed up move semantics. Because then, get value returns the const object, which by default here, without having a move because it's an, it's an R value, is passed, um, passed to the, uh, well, to a R value reference, but it's const, so we cannot pass it to that. We don't have a pushback for that implemented, and it would not be able to do something useful. So that way you have screwed up move semantics if you do things like that. Never put, uh, if your function returns something by value, never mark it with const, never. Don't do that. Okay, <laughs> time to talk about universal references. So we come to the topic of this talk. <laughs> but you have to know this basics to understand the detail. Okay. Think about, you have a class. Let's call it C. We have overloaded functions for the different signatures we just talked about. So the useful signatures, which is um, we want to read the value, or we want to modify the value, or we want to steal the value, we want to adopt the value, we want to use move semantics. You might, in practice, have only one or two of them, not all three of them, but in principle, that is all useful applications we can have. And now, as we saw in the, in, in the slide with the matrix, if I pass an L value, non-const L value, the one in the middle is called. If I pass a const L value, the first one is called. And if I pass a temporary on L value marked with move, a non-const L value marked with move, then uh, we call the third foo. Now, we have again and again in C++ the problem that a function delegates arguments to another function. We have so many examples about that. Um, make shared, for example, and place back, whatsoever. It's one of the biggest features we have, this um, pass something through, as it is. And we, so think about, we, want, we don't want to call foo, we want to call foo indirectly with a function called call foo. So how do we have to implement call foo? And with the rules you just learned, we need for L value references, we are not allowed to use move. For R value references, we need move. So we need different implementations of these functions. So we need move only here. Please don't put move uh, anywhere else, because otherwise you are calling the, for example, in the second function, if you call move there, then the third foo would be called and not the second one, which, which we want to have. So, when we standardized C++11, we said, okay, that's nice. No, that's not nice. How do we write generic code? For one argument, I need three functions. For two arguments, I need all combinations. There are nine functions. For three arguments, I need 27 functions, and with variadic templates, so an arbitrary number of arguments, how do I specify that? So we came up with a special rule, and that was a rule that invented special R-value reference. And the rules were, 
How do you have one function perfectly forwarding something it gets to another function? And three things you need. First thing, you need a template parameter. Second, you have to declare a parameter with this template parameter as an R value reference. So you need an R value reference to a template parameter. A local template parameter, by the way. Not somewhere else in the code. And then third, use forward. And forward has now, if you do these three recipes, these three steps, you have perfect forwarding implemented. Because by some magic, this forward becomes a move if you pass an R value, but only then. Otherwise, this does not have the effect of move. And that's exactly what we needed. So don't even try to understand this code by what you understand about R value references. We have just different rules for these kind of references. So R value references to templates have different rules than R value references to non-templates. What's interesting, we had no special name for this feature. So when we standardized C++, there was no special name in the standard. So Scott Myers came up with the name. And he said, well, you know what? Normally, an R value reference is not allowed to refer to L values, only to R values. But here we can refer to everything, to everything. Well, universally everything. So he came up with the term universal reference. And you can read that term in his book. And we use it in the internet, in the community, to discuss this feature. Unfortunately, a couple of people didn't like that term in the standard committee. There are different stories why. Um, one story is they don't like Scott Myers because he's not in the standard committee, only write books about that. But that's, of course, not true. So they invented another term. The term was forwarding reference. So we have two terms for the same thing. That's really ugly. I mean, we have enough problems in C++ with confusion, with bad names. And now they in, in, invented a different term just because they didn't like universal reference. And it was even worse for a couple of reasons because L value reference says, where are we referring to? To an L value or R value? R value reference says, where are we referring to? Universal reference says, where are we referring to? Well, to both, universally. So now here suddenly we switch to, to forwarding reference, which says, it's the intention of this reference to use it for perfect for for forwarding. Unfortunately, it's not only used for that. And even worse, if you argue with uh, ordinary programmers, oh, they, this, is a, this is a forwarding reference? So if it is a forwarding reference, why do I have to call forward for that? <laughs> well, it's not. What we mean is it's a forwardable reference. <sighs> I sometimes hate us in the standard committee. I hate us, as, really. We make things unnecessarily complicated. And we made them worse for whatever reason. I don't go into details here. So the important thing is that we have two terms. And this thing here, template parameter with 2 ampersand, can refer to everything. Const, non-const, L value, uh, excuse me, uh, yeah, L value or R value. That was important. So if you read code, very carefully look at the details if you find two ampersands. So if you find two ampersands in a declaration, make sure the thing before is not a template parameter, it is something else, a type. Or a template parameter from somewhere else, not from here. That's a rule. <laughs> so here we have a type called type. So this is an R value reference. You can only pass R values. So passing an L value, whether it's cons or non-cons, is not allowed. This has a consequence um, 
that you have no that this thing you get has move semantics. So if you use a T, a template parameter T, with two ampersand, then this is no longer an R value reference. Well, formally it is. It is called in the standard an R value reference, but to a template parameter, we call that universal or forwarding references. I will take the term universal reference most of the time, because it's the right time term. And um, so, you can pass universally everything, we can bind to everything, we can bind to a non-const L value, to a const L value, to a temporary object, so to a, to a PR value and to an X value. Good. So look inside this code. So, for example, if I have the thing on the left, I know the object is never const. It cannot be const. Asking for constants will always be false. This is not true on the right. This might be const or it might not be const. And if you want to forward it to somewhere else, here, move is enough because we know what we got has move semantics. On the right-hand side, you have to use forward. Yes, you can also use forward on the left. That has the same effect. Okay. So, let's see where we are. If we have a function foo CR, and we call it, we pass an L value, a temporary object, or maybe an object, a function returning a const L value reference, um, then if we declare it with const L value reference, we take everything, but everything becomes const inside this function. If we take a non-const reference, we cannot bind to everything. So the interesting benefit of universal references is, beside forwarding, I don't talk about forwarding here, the interesting effect of universal references is that they can bind to everything, like const L value reference, but they don't make the argument const. So they keep non-constness. Okay, and by the way, we also have a way to do that with a declaration. You can use it with, do the same with auto. If you have a const auto L value reference, this binds to everything, but makes it const. If you have a non-const auto L value reference, this does not bind to an R value. If you take a universal reference, this binds to everything and does not have the problem that it makes things const. So it keeps non-constness. So this is a real reference. We refer to a thing and keep it as it is. Yeah? The rules. So how do we specify these rules I showed you in the standard? It's a little bit tricky. Well, remember, we have this. We have this code. Say, template parameter, R value reference to the template parameter, use forward. Well, here are the rules. You pass an L value, you pass a PR value, you pass an X value. So the rule is, first of all, what is the type of T here, of this T? By rule, if you pass an R value, it's just the type of the thing you pass. So our object has type C, so the T is C. By rule, if you pass an R value, there's a special rule in the standard. It says here, if the parameter type, so we talk about this, is an R value reference, it is, to a CV unqualified template parameter. That is, to a template parameter which is neither qualified with const or with volatile. And the argument is an L value. That's what we have here. Then the rule is the type of T is an L value reference to T. So the type of T is this. Okay? So, that's a type of T. So look what we declare here. We could declare it X to be type of T as an R value reference. So, 
the type of X is, well, C, L value reference, reference, reference. We have roots for that. We have roots for what we call reference collapsing. So if one of the references is an L value reference, the result is an L value reference. Only if what we have is an R value reference and we use it as an R value reference, then it remains to be an R value reference. And therefore, we have this difference. Okay. Well, I didn't explain one thing. Why does now forward make a difference? Because if you look what move does, I told you we just convert the object to an R value reference of its type. That's pretty simple. We remove any reference from the object type and add to ampersand. That's all. If we have forward, we don't remove two ampersands or whatever we have there before. We just take the type of what we pass and add two ampersands. So that's again reference collapsing. So if you have something that is just a plain type and then you use the two ampersands, you have an R value reference. So for a temporary object, for a PR value, that's a type of a PR value, you have an R value. R value reference. So here, we, if we have an L value, which we pass, declared as this one, um, then by the rules of reference collapsing, the resulting thing is an L value. And that has the effect that if we pass an L value, remember, if we pass an L value, by rule T, the T here we use is an L value reference. So L value reference used as R value reference has no effect. It's still an L value reference. So this is passed without the effect of move. Did you get it? No, it doesn't matter. Compilers know that. That's a good thing. You should just know that if you have this difference we had before, on the left-hand side, 2% we have a type. On the right-hand side, 2% we have a template parameter that the rules are slightly different. And what you can see, if you ask for the type T here, in case you pass an L value, type T is an L value reference. That's a type of T. And then using T with 2 ampersand, make sure that the X here is an L value reference. These are the rules. I told you, that it's important not only that the thing in front of the ampersand is a template parameter, it has to be a local template parameter. So that it, it's not only bad that we have the same syntax for two very different things. We really have to look very carefully about details. So look at this here. Um, foo s uh, is a function taking an R value reference, you can only pass R values. This is T, template parameter T, okay, you can pass everything. So what about this? What if in your function you have an R value reference to a member of a template parameter? Huh? Do you know it? By rule, that's not a universal reference. That is an R value reference. So that means you cannot pass here an iterator that is an L value. You have to mark it with move. Next example. In your class T, you have declared a function taking a T to ampersand. By the way, this could be class vector. This could be pushback. So the pushback taking a T ampersand ampersand, that's not a universal reference. That is an ordinary R value reference because the type we take in front of the T ampersand is not locally, it's outside, it's a class parameter template type. So this is also not a universal or forwarding reference. And same is true here for this. This is an, an ordinary R value reference where you can only which you can only initialize with R values. 
There are tricks to make it possible for such a member function to be gener gen as generic that you can e really use it as a universal reference. You have to introduce an additional template parameter initialized with the same parameter as here. And then this member function works as a universal reference. Oh, we hate C++, I know. Okay, third example. What was that? Ah, full specializations. By rule, full specializations are no universal references. <laughs> okay. <sighs> we really should have invented a different syntax for that. Some people discuss these days. We didn't discuss it those days. Three ampersands. That is a problem. Your reaction is a problem. It would not look cool, but everybody would understand the code. We in the standard committee sometimes prefer coolness over simplicity. That's a big mistake for a complex language like C++. A big mistake. So, for example, you want to have a universal reference to a specific type. Remember, so you want to have a reference that can take an L value or an L value, but you don't want to take any type. How you do you declare that? Well, it's in C20, it's pretty easy. You have a requirement saying this template parameter T, because T is a T ampersand ampersand, has a requirement that it is, if you remove the reference, that it has this specific type. So that's a way you say, I want to have one function taking all kinds of STD strings. If you want to have support here, conversions, implicit conversions, please use convertible to. If you want to have explicit conversion, please use constructible from in the requirement. But we also have the other way around. How do you say, I want to have a parameter that takes only R values. So it's a generic R value, but not a universal reference, but uh, it is uh, generic, yeah. So how, how do we create an R value, an, an object that only binds to R values, not to L values? So here's a trick requires not that t is an L value reference. Remember, the deduction rules say if you call a function with an L value, t becomes an L value reference. So that way we rule that out. So that way we only call take R values. Um, this is C++ 20 code. In C++, uh, before C++ 20, it looks like that. <laughs> Enable if. Okay, there are other ways to do that, by the way. Um, this is just one example what you can do. And please note, don't check here, is the type T L value reference? You ha also have to deal with the fact that callers of this function might explicitly specify the template parameter, and then still the right thing should happen. Okay, so don't only think about type deduction when you implement that. Good. That's universal references, the basics of universal references. <laughs> so, let's talk about some details. Okay, we have learned how to forward something perfectly. Template parameter, 2 ampersand, forward. Universal or forwarding references. How do you return something perfectly? Well, auto does not work, because auto returns by value. Auto decays. So whatever you return, uh, even arrays become pointers, and also um, it ignores any referenceness. If you declare something with auto, you always create a new value, a new object with its own address. And the same applies if you return something. 
So usually that's good, by the way, <laughs> because a function should better not return a reference to something inside the function. But sometimes this foo, which I call here inside call foo, returns you something that can be used from the outside. So you want to return this by reference. And this might be even something movable. So you might return something that can the call off, call foo, then moves to somewhere else. So you might say, oh, I know how, that, how to do that. Auto to ampersand, that's a universal reference. But no, no, don't do that. That's always a reference. If foo returns a temporary object, you return a reference to a local temporary object. No good idea. Fortunately, most compilers warn you about that. So this, when we had this problem, we invented something in C++14, and it was, that was the reason we have decal type auto. Who has heard about decal type auto? Who has used it? A little bit less. <laughs> okay, so that is um, using the rules of decal type, which are an interesting slide of 10 minutes in itself. And um, they, uh, they have the rule that they return perfectly temporaries by value and references by references. So the, the trick of decal type auto is if you have a value, return by value. If you have a reference, return by reference. So, here are the rules. Here's the matrix of all the things you can have in generic code here using auto. So if you have something with auto, you always have a new object of the specified type. Uh, you even skip constness. If the initial value has const, the new object is not const. If you have auto with 1% so L value reference, um, non-const L value reference, we have the problem, like, if we pass something to a non-const L-value reference, we cannot pass R-values. So you can only pass L-values, and then this is a reference that might or might not be const, depending on what you pass in. If you have a const auto L-value reference, it bites to everything, but makes everything const. If you have a universal reference, so auto with 2%, um, you keep constness and you keep L value and R value ness, or you keep move semantics or not move semantics. So if you pass something temporary or marked with move, what you get is an R value reference. Otherwise, you get an L value reference, which might be const. And if you have decal type auto, that is a magic type to say, depending on what we pass, we either get a value or a reference. Well, this is a tool set. The experts who implement generic code and frameworks use. Uh, if you look in the, in the library how it is implemented, you will see a lot of these features inside. So, one question remains. So, what if inside a function, I don't want to immediately return something? I want to return it later but I want to perfectly return it, keep its value category and the type. So here it is. If you call inside a function and you want to keep it for later, use auto with 2 ampersand. That's okay, because the lifetime of what you get here is extended to the end of the scope, and we keep, whether it's cons or non-cons, whether it has move semantics or not, Perfectly. So if you then later use it, take the value and forward it with decal type of the value and the value. And then you, if you got back something with move semantics, you have moved it to foo2. If, if not, you have passed it through. Now here you see, we, this also returns something. Foo, the call to foo2 returns something, which is initialized or does initialize our return type, which is decal type auto for reasons you just learned. If you want to return a value or a reference, decal type auto is your friend. So here, you say, okay, let's take that. So if we take here return, it would work fine, but again, we might use this return value later on. 
So inside declare it with decal type auto and then write this code. Pretty easy, huh? So the code is now look at compile time, what we got here with decal type auto. If it is an R value reference, so if the thing that was removed uh, returned by this foo2 call, return it with move. So that way we pass forward, we pass back move semantics. Otherwise, do it not. Well, you could always do return move of red, but there's a problem. If you move something out, which is, um, which is temporary, then the return value optimization might apply. With STD move, you disable it. So the reason we have this if context is we, we only want to apply move if it's not a temporary object, so if it's not a PR value. Otherwise, we disable return value optimization. Well, in fact, we disable named return value optimization. So please don't never put a move here. And by the way, also never put parentheses around this rat because that's a very nice side effect of decal type auto. By rule, I don't explain why. If you put this in parentheses, the return type changes to a reference. That's for next year talk. Okay. So, you got all the rules, and now we come back to C20. If you write this code in C20, you can now write call foo differently. Instead of passing, saying this is a template parameter, you can just declare it as auto ampersand ampersand, R value reference to an uh, R value reference. Well, that's not an R value reference, that's a universal reference to whatever we get. Um, so, uh, since C20, we can use auto in any generic function, not only in lambdas. It has the same effect, except that here we have a name for T, here we don't have it. Oh, yeah, I have to fix the slide. That's wrong. So this T, I have to change to a decal type of arc. Yeah, that's, that's an error. Sorry. Sorry. Just copy and paste without fixing all the code. Okay. So that's it. Oh, we have half an hour left. Okay. Let's talk about using universal references in real life. And the first thing I want to talk to you is about the range-based for loop. I don't talk this time about how much it is broken and the standard committee is not willing to fix it now for 10 years. That's a different topic. I'm still pissed you hear that. I talk about something different. I'm talking about how is the range-based for loop implemented and how do I call it? Two things. Both need universal references. So, and that, by the way, was introduced in C++11. So that was the first proof that forwarding references is a bad name because here we don't need forward, but we still need universal references. So I tell you what we have. So the rule is, the specification in the standard is, that if you find a range-based for loop call, so for, you have a colon in the middle, on the left-hand side a declaration, on the right-hand side something you can iterate over, and then statements in the body. This is equivalent, well, there are three things that are tried out, but this is the main thing. Um, this is equivalent to a loop using iterators to iterate over the collection. And then inside the body, going to the value of the elements and there, initialize this declaration there. So think about you write that code for each element with console auto reference in what is returned by get data. Well, the compiler converts it to this. If that compiles, that compiles and has the same effect. That's how we specify the range-based for loop. So, why don't we take call here and 
use it here and there. So we, because we have to call both begin and end, we have to use the return value of the thing on the right twice. And there is no way in C++ to use something twice without introducing a name. The name might be an L value, it might be an R value reference, it might be an L value reference, whatsoever, but you need a name to use something twice. So we need a name, but we don't want to copy the thing we got. So we initialize the reference so that we can now use that return value here to call begin and here to call end. So now the question is, what is the type of this reference? Well, I think you saw that coming. <laughs> it's a universal or forwarding reference. Well, it's not a forwarding reference. Nothing is forwarding here. It's a universal reference. Because we need support here that we have, can pass whatever we have on the right-hand side. It should always work. Always work. And the only reference we have that always works are const L value reference and R value reference or universal reference. And the problem with const L value reference is it makes everything const, which changes the behavior of the loop. So we have to use a universal reference here. And if we would use alto, we would create a copy of the return value. If we would use const alto L value reference, we would make all the elements const. And if we use a non-const L value reference, we could not initialize it with a temporary object. So we had to use auto ampersand ampersand, a universal reference. Yeah? And nothing with forward here. It's just because we need the other benefit of universal references that they can universally refer to everything and keeping non-constness. That's Another reason to have that. Okay. That is about the implementation of the range-based for loop. How do we use the range-based for loop? Well, here's an example. Let's set all the elements in the pass collection, that's the first argument, to the value pass as second argument, generic code. Any type for the collection on the front, any type for the value on the right. So for each element, non-const reference, so that we don't create a copy of the elements which we modify, want to modify the original elements, in this collection, assign the value. Pretty straightforward code. Let's use it. Oh, yeah, we have a vector of int. Let's set all the elements to 42, of course. Works fine. Let's use a vector of bool. Compile time error. This does not compile. Huh? Why the hell does this not compile? Well, we made a couple of mistakes in C++ standardization. With initialization, we have a mess. ADL, vector of bool was one of the big messes we made. We thought, oh, we have a cool feature called specialization, temp specializa specialization of templates. But as a result, we got only nightmares. So only nightmares. If, if, if we ever have a problem with containers, it's because of vector bool. I, you can bet on that. So we would like to get rid, rid of that. We, the trick is, vector bool has something that no other container has. This is the code we generate from that. Yeah? That, so the call above would call this. We iterate over the elements of a vector bool. What are the elements of a vector bool? Well, these are bits. The trick of vector bool is, that we store elements which are Boolean values, so we store them as single bits. So the first eight elements are stored in the first byte. 
provided a byte has eight bits, which is not always guaranteed, but that's a different question. Okay. But how can we iterate over these objects? How can you iter iterate from bit to bit? <laughs> well, you need a helper type for that. So we have helper types, and one helper type is what is a reference to a value inside a vector bool? And it's an object of a helper type called vector bool reference. Now you see the problem. If, when, why we are iterating, we go to the value. The value is an object of the type vector bool reference, which is a temporary object, a PR value. You cannot assign a PR value to a non-const L value reference. Therefore, this does not compile. That's a fix for you as an application programmer. If you want to write generic code that even works, that modifies elements, and even works for vector bool, you have to use universal reference as declaration for the element in the range based follow. I know a few programmers who do that always. They always have to explain their code. <laughs> sometimes they can, sometimes not. Yeah, fortunately, nobody uses vector bool anymore. Somebody, some do. Yeah, but the, as I said, it was a nightmare. Okay, so yeah, that's application programmer's code where you have to use universal references if you want to write generic code that even iterates in a writing way over the elements of a vector bool. You have to do things like that. So, that is, by the way, already a problem in C++ 11. So, where we introduced um, R value references and the range based for loop. Now, let's look why I said we see this problem more and more coming in C++ 20. So this is code I would say nobody does that in practice. And if this does not compile, our programmers are used to not understand the error messages and try something else. They really are used to that because C++ is beyond any, any possible way of understanding what's going wrong for ordinary programmers. We have screwed it up. We have screwed this language up, certainly. But now we have C++20, and we have introduced something cool, which is ranges and views. So think about you have a print function, and the print function says, let's iterate over the elements of a range. Well, you can even specify with a concept that you can only pass ranges. Ranges are, yeah, containers or container-like objects where you can iterate from begin to end. Here we don't use a range-based for loop. Here we use um, iterators directly, so we call begin and end. And by using not rg.begin, but scranges begin, this even works for raw arrays. So this is code that in principle can print all the elements of a past range. We have only read access to the range, of course, taking a const L value reference. And you see the qualification in front of auto, that's new in C20, says restricts that you get a proper error message or that this does not compile um, if you don't pass in something that fulfills the requirement of something of a range where you can iterate over the values to read them. So we'll, we call that an input range. So if we have a vector, we can call print and it works. It prints out. And of course, this collection is not copied because we pass it by reference. Good. What you can do in C20 is you can have views. Views are subsets of um, ranges. Well, the subset might be some elements or the elements with some modification. Something like that. It's not, it's not the container, 
it's more a descriptive way why we are iterating, ignore the first three elements or take the first three elements or with each element, negate it or so. It's a, I, yeah, it, it works a little bit like that. If you say, uh, I want to take from this collection the first three elements, what you really create is an object and that object internally refers to the original collection and knows that we only want to take the first three elements and then maybe we apply to that Another view that says, and each element, please negate, so do a transformation. And they all provide an API with begin, end, and plus plus, and star. So the usual API to iterate over the elements. So if you here, for example, call pos equals the begin of the second view here, you call begin to this view. The view says, oh, I need the begin of this view. I need the, goes to the collection set, I need the begin. The collection gives back the begin. Um, V2 says it's okay, it's part of the first three elements. Um, V2 says, okay, I give you the position. And then when we later on call the star operator, we have to negate the value. And that's also done by now we have the position, now we have to negate it. Um, so on demand, while we are iterating, views are applied to existing collections. If you go plus plus, you go further. If you, you might have other views like filters that only take even or odd elements, so you would skip some elements. And that would mean um, when we call plus plus, the next view says call plus plus, oh, that doesn't fit, call plus plus again, but for the caller from the outside, this is not seen. Or here, take says, if you, if, you, if we three times call plus plus to this view, it says, no, that's the end of my range. We are at the end. And it returns like what we always have if we iterate over elements, it returns the end. Good. So, sounds good. So let's start to use that. I've removed the concept here. Now, so pretty simple code. What might be surprising you is cons out or f, but think about template type name t and cons t l value reference. You could write code that way, print out all the elements. We have thousands of functions like that. Print out all the elements of a container. Works for vector. Awesome. Works for list. Awesome. Works for views. Awesome. So in a vector, we only print the first three elements. Then we stop. In a list, we only print the first three elements. Then we stop. Great. Cool feature. Views are great. Programmers trying it out say, hooray! And then they call drop. Oh, no, works, great. For vector, yeah, skip the first three elements. Yes. Uh, let's switch to a range-based for loop and use it directly behind the colon. Yeah, you can say, let's iterate all the elements from a list pipe into drop. Works. Awesome. There's something com coming, you feel? Let's call print list pipe to drop. Compile time error. What? A compile time error? What did I do wrong? Nothing. Works as designed. OK. Note again, drop here directly used does work, but not if I pass the same to this function. <laughs> yes, we standardize that. I hope you know that. It's one of the biggest mistakes we made in views. Filter, oh, 
does also not compile. So what is the problem? The problem is this const. For some views, some views, always or sometimes iterating does not work if the view is declared to be const. Wow. Why? Well, think about, we call here drop, which might be the same as initializing a view that refers to this and says, well, let's drop the first three elements, and then let's use a transformation, and then let's call it. And that is call begin. The problem is now, begin has to find the first valid element, which means three times we have to call plus plus. Or we can jump to the third element. Oh, if we can jump to the third element, that's cheap. In a vector, we can jump to the third element. In a list, we can't. It's not a random access uh, container. So, We decided that we want to keep begin cheap. Therefore, we don't support that call. If drop is called on a non-random access container. Works as designed. Eh, we can discuss that. So there were other options where we could have said, let's fake constants. The problem is, oh, the problem is why? Why is it a problem? Because we want, if we, if we use uh, begin here, ideally, once we have called and found begin, which we even have to do with the non-const, view, we have to store the location of the begin, of the first element. Because otherwise, the next begin would again iterate to find the first element. That's a waste of performance. So because we want to cache the begin once we have found it, the drop view can no longer be const. There would have been other options. We could have said it's mutable, so we fake that it's cons. I don't know the answer why that was not chosen as an option. Um, and we could, of course, say, well, the moment we initialize it, we call it once. So it could, could, we could call it in the construction time. Um, we had a rule when C++20 was standardized, construction of a view should not be expensive. Fortunately, that rule is gone now for other reasons. So maybe we can change that in future. I, yesterday I asked something in the Kusanat committee. I didn't get an answer. Maybe I'm missing something. I was not involved in the design of this library. I can only tell you the effect and what I understood for, as a reason. So that's the reason we, we have this problem. And the same is for filter. Again, the filter wants, with the first call of begin, initialize internally the location of the first element to cache it. And that means, yeah, it cannot be const. If that's not a useful application of mutable, I don't know why you have mutable in the standard, but that's a different thing. Okay, so what is the uh, solution? The solution is, of course, you have to use universal references. Because the problem is, when we pass a collection, we make it const. And uh, no, with a universal reference, we can bind to everything and without making it const. So now all the views work 
filter drop, drop for list works fine. The other option is you can pass by value. <laughs> and we have a problem with when we pass a container directly because the container is copied just to print out the elements. So that's the worst option. So when, you, when we discussed that problem with the designers of views, I said, yeah, use views by value. Uh, yeah, and if I want to write code that uses both containers and views, well, you can say, there's another thing. You can say, um, let's require, no, here. Let's require that we only take views and the caller has to convert the vector to a view or create a view to this container. So pass it by reference. So it's kind of CREF, std CREF, if you, have, if you know that. But the benefit of std views all is that it's still in a range. So you don't have to cast it back. You can still iterate over the elements. So that, is, that way this would not compile, but you would have to do that in that function. And then I should explain that this to my customers, having this print function, the old one, taking a const L by reference. Hey, come on, guys. Fundamental bad design. A big mistake in the usability of C++. Yes, for a good reason. I agree with that. But I think it's a huge mistake. It's not the only mistake with const. We also break const propagation and C begin. But that's a different story. That's it. So what you learned here in this talk, hopefully, and it's only my opinion, and a lot of people will disagree with me, especially those in the standard committee, and standardized ranges and views. And the range based follow-up. And choose the name forwarding reference. References you can use as R value references to template parameters. Can be called universal reference or forwarding reference. They can be used for perfect forwarding, but that's not the only application. You just saw in your view code there was nothing with forward. We just needed the benefit to refer to something without making it const, even if it's an R value. So that's where we need a universal reference. And it's necessary now for generic code taking containers and C++ 20 views and all of C++ 20 views. Please note, in C++ 20, there will be no longer any way to declare a function that it takes both non-const and const containers and views and guarantees that the elements are not modified, not by the signature. You have to do something inside the function to fix that. I think that's a nightmare. That's a nightmare. We, we lose some of the most important things. We could be sure that if we pass something with const t reference, the elements were const in each collection. They screwed that up intentionally. They said, yeah, a view is not a collection. A view is a pair of pointers. And for pointers, we also don't delegate constness. Hey, semantics matter, not how you implement things. And semantically, a view is a subset of a collection and it should not break and screw up what you can do with collections. Oh my goodness, I'm so angry. You hear that? Because programmers will fall into all these traps. And I have now a, question, a couple of questions. So which terminology should I use? Yes, I've made my decision. But I have to explain both terms. When should I teach now universal references? To beginners, in the first week, should I introduce call by reference at the beginning? I think that's, to some kind, it's easier than to teach 
the other references. But this is a thought model I really have to think very carefully about. I didn't do it yet. Don't worry. And where the hell exactly should I use universal references? Have I to use universal references? You've seen that your code, your generic code, printing all the elements of a container, taking a const LVI reference instead of a universal reference, it's broken now since C20. Well, broken in a sense that it does not work for some of the views. And we are wondering why people hate C. I should be thankful. I sell more books. Thank you. Thank you, Standard Committee. But you made a really, really, really bad job. You lost priorities. And priorities should be simplicity, especially in C, because C is far too complex to understand for ordinary programmers. That will cause a lot of trouble when others see this talk. I'm pretty sure about that. So that's just my opinion. I'm happy to discuss it. And that's it. I talk a lot about C++ move semantics and R value references and universal references in my book that describes this little feature, move semantics, which has 260 pages only. And then there's a C++ 20 book coming, also available already as draft, which will have something like 700 slides, but more than just gradients and views and coroutines and modules and the things that are broken there. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>